Philippians, thank you so much for joining us for Bible study on tonight. Our scripture tonight will come from Proverbs 16, verse number 7. Proverbs 16, verse number 7. And it says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. And that's Proverbs 16, verse number 7. Our song for today is, Come and go with me to my father's house. To my father's house. To my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house because there is joy, there is peace, and there is happiness. Come and go with me to my father's house. To my father's house. Oh, to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house. for another privilege to come into your house. We know that there's peace, joy, love in your house. We ask you to bless us now, Father God. Forgive us for our sins, bless our lives, that nothing separates us from you. Bless us as we hear your word, that your word will be real to us, that we will run and tell others about the word of God. It's in Jesus' name we ask you to speak to us tonight. Amen. Thank God. To my Father's house. Yeah, to my father's house, come and go with me. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to you go. my father's house. There is joy, joy, joy. Yes, Lord, I'm looking forward to the day. Not that I'm willing to jump on the bus today, but I'm looking forward to the day where God welcomes us into this house. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Last week we ended by talking about God being immutable, immutable. On page 44 of our Experience in God book, we talked about God never changes. He is immutable. I-M-M-U-T-A-B-L-E. I M-M-U-T-A-B-L-E. I-M-M. U-T-A-B-L-E. God is 
immutable. He is the God who never changes. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't change? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if our attitudes never changed? First of all, we gotta be right, and then we will wish that others wouldn't change. Yeah. But sometimes we wish people would change. Hmm. The God we serve is an immutable God. He never changes. He is God all the time. He has structure, and when we're in trouble, we need to hear from him. Yeah. When we're not in trouble, we need to hear from him. Mm -hmm. We need to hear from him from God. On page 44 of the book, Experiencing God, at the very bottom of that page, so today we're going to finish that final paragraph out, and then we're going to talk about this God we serve. Okay. It says, God loves you. He wants to have a close personal relationship with you. He wants you to depend on him when you seek a word from him. He wants you to learn to hear his voice and know his will. Your relationship with him is the key to hearing when God speaks. Consider praying this prayer. God, I pray that I will grow in my relationship with you so that when you speak, I immediately recognize your voice and respond in obedience. Amen. We know that God speaks several ways. What are some of those ways that God is still speaking we, we talked about on last week that God is no longer speaking by way of the prophets. Hebrews chapter 1 says, at sundress time, King James says, at sundress time, God spoke to the prophets and the prophets spoke to the people. If you look at any other version, it says, in times past. God spoke to the people by way of the prophets. Now this is time that has passed. So there is no need for him to speak today by way of the prophet. Yes, no, maybe so. Amen. Comments, questions? No, clear? clear? As good. Mm -hmm. So there, there is no reason, there are no reasons for God to speak to us by way of the prophets. Hebrew says that God spoke to us that way, or spoke to them rather, that way in times past. And if he spoke in times past, that means he's not speaking today. But there are ways that he, he is speaking. What are those ways? Number one, through the word of God, through the Bible. Number two, two through prayer. So we ought to spend our time in prayer with God because God is speaking through prayer. Number three, through circumstances. God is speaking through our circumstances. And number four, he is speaking through the church. God is revealing his purpose. He's revealing his ways through the church, through circumstances, through prayer, and through the Bible. How many of you want to know God's purpose? You want to know God's purpose, not just for your life, but for God. Tonight, we're going to talk about the fact that it's not about us. It is not about us at all. What God does, he does it for his purpose and for his ways. God is speaking to us so we can get to see, hear, and experience his purpose and his ways. God is revealing himself to us by way of his purpose and his ways. God wants us to get this, that it's not about us. Songwriter says, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. It's about God. So God is speaking. On page 45, let's look at um, day five. Day five of unit two. Day five, God speaks with a purpose. God speaks with a purpose. We tend to want God to speak to us so he will give us a heartwarming devotional thought to make us feel good for the rest of the day. If we want, if you want the 
the God of the universe to speak to you, you need to be ready for him to reveal what he is doing, where you are. In scripture, God is not often coming, often seen coming and speaking to people just for conversation's sake. He was always working to accomplish his purpose. When God speaks to you through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, the church, or another way, he has a specific purpose in mind. Amen. The author says that we want warm and fuzzy. The author says that we want God to speak to us so he can warm our heart and give us a devotional thought. Devotional thoughts are something that we can take and share with other people, and we ought to share them with other people. But the reason why God is speaking is not so we can just get a, a warm, a heartwarming devotional thought. God is speaking because he has a purpose. He speaks with purpose. God is speaking with a purpose in mind. We have to do what we call kanania, get in touch with God and in tune with God so that we will know his purpose. The author even talks about God is just not walking around so we can feel good speaking to people. The author says that he's not coming to us just so we can have a conversation with him. Every time God spoke, and the Bible is confirming it today, every time God speaks, he is speaking with his purpose in mind. So what makes God speak with his purpose in mind? Because he's God. He's sovereign. He created us. We are his creation. The psalmist says it like this. We are your people. You have made us and not we ourselves. We belong to you. God has a purpose in mind. When he made you, he made you with purpose. Over a period of time, we think we have our purpose. And many times we make sure that we align our purpose with God's purpose. But there are other times that God has a purpose that we are so far out of tune with. We are so far off base. The author says that he's not, God is not speaking to us just because he wants to have a, a nice little conversation. Now it is good for you to have a conversation with God. It is good for you to have a plan to commune with God. It's always good for you to stay in touch and in tune with God because you develop that fellowship with him, that kindness, that intimacy, in the previous chapter, it talks about we ought to have kindness and intimacy with God. We ought to have a right fellowship with Him. We ought to have intimacy with Him. But when it comes to doing God's will and God calling us to do something, He has a purpose in mind. Think about it. What purpose did God place you on planet Earth? What was the purpose God placed you? Did he just want to give your mom and dad something to do? <laughs> Did he want to give your, your mom and dad just the joy of their lives? Did he just want to give my mom and dad headaches? <laughs> Did he really just create uh, us on planet Earth so we can have the news report to come out say a bouncing boy, a bouncing girl, beautiful little baby. Why did God place you here? And then, am I in God's purpose? In the scripture, God often calls people, and he called them, and he comes to them for his purpose. He speaks to them for his purpose, not just for conversation's sake. What is your purpose? Anybody? Have you discovered any purpose? Anybody think anything? You ought, to, you ought to be able to name five of them right away. So God placed all of us on earth for the purpose of leading folk to Christ and glorifying him, right? So all of us are placed on earth. We are all saved so we can glorify God and our purpose 
ought to be able be to lead people to Christ and be able to lead people to Christ. When we finish Bible study, when we finish Sunday school, when we finish preaching on Sunday, there is an invitation given. The reason why we do the invitation, number one, is to what they call in Mississippi, search the house. And in revivals in, in the country back home, they would search the house even before the preacher preached. A preacher's assignment that night, one of the preacher's assignment before the evangelist stand is to search the house. And when he searched the house, he would, he would give an invitation even before the word of God is preached. He would soften the ground. He would have people to think about if you were to die today, where will you go? His responsibility is to appeal to the people, the Savior Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead. Can you trust him tonight? Will you trust him tonight? And many have come to Christ even before the preacher preached because the guy who's assigned to search the house, his assignment is to appeal to the hearts of the people that they would get to know Jesus. Another reason why we make sure that we lead people to Christ publicly is so that everybody in New Beginning Church will feel comfortable leading somebody to Christ. Everybody at the New Beginning Church ought to be comfortable by now after 20 years to lead somebody to Christ. How many people have you led to Christ? How many people have you presented the gospel to? God has placed you on planet Earth for this purpose of introducing somebody to Jesus. I oftentimes say it doesn't matter if you're cooking tea cakes. You ought to have an evangelistic purpose with your cooking of tea cakes. If you're raising pets, there ought to be an evangelistic purpose. I have two different fish bowls in our house. Two of them. Sister Davis has declared that that's not her purpose. She doesn't look after them. She just walked by them and scared them. And the only time she talks to them is when she says, ain't nobody messing with you. Because when they see her coming, they get busy and moving and slamming themselves against the glass and crawling behind the rocks and and I think she enjoys it. So they think, they think that her purpose is to make their lives miserable. But when I look in the fish bowl, I see fish acting like people. In, 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 in the fish bowl, I, I, I had a cross in the fish bowl. So every now and then they go to church. Every now and then one will stop by the cross. And several of them have gone all the way from here. But they didn't go by the cross on a regular basis. They did just like church folks. They stopped by the church sometimes. What's your purpose? Why are you here? Your purpose is to, number one, glorify God. Number two, lead others to Christ. Number three, live a godly life so others can see your witness. So we got our purpose, right? We have a purpose, and our purpose is to accomplish God's will. God speaks to us through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, through the church, and he may even choose another way. But anything that God does, we have to keep in mind, God does it with purpose. Number next. Genesis 12, uh, verse 1 through 3. Now the Lord has said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. 
When God spoke to Abram, see Genesis 12, what was God about to do? He was about to begin building the holy nation. Notice God's timing. Why did God speak to Abram when he did? Because it was then God wanted to start building the nation. The moment Abram knew what God was about to do, he had to adjust his life to God. He had to immediately follow what God said. The moment God speaks to you is the time. He wants you to respond to him. Don't think you have the next three or four months to decide whether it is God's timing. The moment God speaks to you is God's timing. That is why he chooses to speak when he does. He speaks to his servants when he is ready to move. Otherwise, he wouldn't speak. As God enters the mainstream of your life, the timing of your response is crucial. When God speaks to you, you need to believe and obey him. Amen. So when we look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God makes some promises. What are some of the promises that God makes? Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Sister Wilma, what are some of the speech that God uses when he talks to Abraham? By April at this point. I will make you a great nation. He's going to make him a great nation. Is he talking about Abraham turning into a nation? Is he talking about Abram turning into the United States of America? What is he talking about when he said, I will make you a great nation? What is he talking about? Excuse me? The descendants of the descendants. He's going to, he's going to have descendants. And these descendants will turn out to be a great nation. What's the next promise he makes? I will bless you. He says it's going to bless him. God says, I'm going to make you happy. I'm going to make you blessed. I'm going to make you prosperous. God makes Abraham a promise. He said, get out from one of these folk. Your kin folk. Your, your religion. I am going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. Then what did he say? Make your name great. I'm going to make your name great. When your name is called, it's going to be called and you're going to be great. People are going to recognize your name for generations and generations and generations to come. Here we are, many thousand years later, still talking about Abram becoming Abraham. He changed his name from Abram to Abraham. He made his name great. What's the next thing he promises him? You should be a blessing. You're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing. Let me just serve you notice. God has blessed you just so you can be blessed. God has blessed you so you can bless others. God has put things under your control in your charge so that you can be a blessing. And he wants you to be a blessing to somebody other than you and your family and your friends. Some people are a blessing, but they're only a blessing to their family members, themselves, and their friends. He wants you to be a blessing to your foes. What's the for? Enemy. Somebody who don't agree with you. God wants you to be a blessing. Any more blessings God promised Abraham or Abram? What else does he say? He's going to bless folk that bless him. Mm -hmm. Abram, your name is going to be so special, so great. You're going to be such a special person because you got faith in me. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, I mean Romans chapter 4, he says that Abram obeyed God and it was credited to him as faith. His faith made him whole. His faith made him different. He was righteous. His faith made him righteous. When he walked in faith, people couldn't see what he saw. He couldn't see what God saw, but he walked in faith. Are you walking in faith? God promised Abraham, uh, Abram, that I am going to bless you and people who bless you, I am going to bless them. What other promise he made? 
curse them that curse thee. I'm going to curse folk that curse you. I'm going to fight your battles. I am going to fight your battles. You don't have to worry about your enemies. I'm going to curse anybody who curses you. You just keep your faith in God. So he says, God spoke to Abram, and God knew what God was going to do. God already knows what God is going to do. He's asking you to come and join him where he's already at work. God has perfect timing. I mean, you know, God, God has timing that we, go, we don't have. Sometimes we get frustrated with God's timing. Sometimes we get angry with God's timing. Mm -hmm. But God has perfect timing. Mm -hmm. And when we sit back and we watch God operate, we find out later that God has perfect timing. If God had a move just two seconds earlier, it would not have been perfect timing. Mm -hmm. But God has perfect timing and we have to make sure that we are walking with the God that has the perfect time. Amen. He knew what he was going to do. He was building a holy nation. So he didn't go get involved with somebody else. He got involved with Abram because he had in mind, he had in his heart, that I am going to build a holy nation through Abram. I'm going to build something. He didn't talk to Abraham when he was 60, he waited till Abraham was, Abram was 75 years old. He knew he was going to build a nation. He knew he was going to do it in his timing. There was no need of him talking to him at 60. When he was starting the process, he was laying out the blueprint at 75. I'm telling you, God is some kind of God. He doesn't think like we think. He doesn't react like we react. He has perfect timing. Why did God speak to Abram when he did? Because it was then that God wanted to start building a great nation. It was at that time that God had to make sure that Abram knew what was going on. Why well, talk about where you're going and what you're going to do if it's not going to happen now. God has perfect time. And check this out. With the moment that God spoke to Abraham, then Abraham had to adjust his schedule. Isn't that something? We ask God to do things and we partner with God and collaborate with God to do some things but we want God to get on our timetable. Yeah. We want God to adjust his timetable to our timeline. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. And all of us as humans do it that way. Even the preachers and pastors do it that way. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard people pray and say, Lord, do it right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus? Mm -hmm. yeah. Lord, we want you to do it right now. I tell this story about Pastor Terry Anderson saying he's at a revival, he's getting ready to preach. Two preachers surrounded him and said, man, I'm asking God for your anointing. I want God to give us the anointing that you have. He said, okay, let's pray about it. He grabbed their hands. And when he grabbed their hands, he said, Lord, bless these men to lose their house. Bless them to lose their cars. Bless them to lose their wives. And by the time he said, bless them to lose three times, they snatched their hands out of his hand and said, man, we didn't ask you to pray for that. He said, yeah, you asked for my anointing. I didn't get this anointing just having to walk in the park. God had to take me through some things. We don't want God to take us through anything, and we want God to do it right now, God, because you are right now, God. We have to remember that God has perfect timing, and because he has perfect timing, we have to watch what God is doing. Amen. The, the moment God spoke to Abraham, 
then Abraham begins to adjust his timing to God's time. Are you willing to adjust your timing to God's time? I was with Pastor Leslie Smith a while back, and he had this picture of his apartment complex in his office. And I remember back in the 80s when he was talking about this apartment complex, and, and now it's becoming a reality right next door to his office. I guess 72 units went up, and, and we were talking about how God had blessed him. And, and you know, I, I was talking to him about how I'm waiting on God to bless us with our either a complex or a neighborhood. And uh, I said, man, I just need to catch your coattail. That joker said to me, Brother Whitlock, he said, man, it took me 30 years to do this. <laughs> I said, I ain't got 30 years. I'm too old to wait 30 years. But I do believe God has perfect time. I'm still waiting and praying and watching what God is going to do. And I'm open to what he's going to do. But I'm asking God just like you do. Lord, do it now, Lord. <laughs> Fix it now, Lord. And then I can give God all the reasons why. You know, Houston is full of homeless people. Gentrification is taking over our native neighborhoods. Lord, there are so many people that are not homeless, but they need affordable home. Lord, do it now, Lord. I have to keep in mind, God has perfect time. Another analogy is, and I've said it several times before, it's amazing to me that when a pastor resigns from one church, to go to another church is always a mega church that's two, three times bigger, two, three times more members. It's always a prosperous experience. My question was, how is it that God never called me in to leave mega churches to go to a small church? Is that the way God operates? They gonna do that? No. Why not? If we're in God's will, if we're working for God's purpose, why can't we leave the big city church to go to a country church with 25 people, whereas there are 2,500 in the city? Can't afford it. Oh, so that's, that's the principle that's working? If he's a good steward over the little, then God gives him a lot. <laughs> Pastor friend of mine tells the story how, how um, and this is a training program for young preachers. He said to me, he said, I never, and you should never, <clears throat> tell anybody what, to, what your honorary should be. You should never tell a church what you want to be paid for preaching or teaching. He, he gives an example. Pastor John Morgan, the founder of the Sage Bunch Church, he gives an example. He says, the preacher came to him and he said, now I'm going to do this workshop for you. I'm going to preach for you and I've got to have $500. Uh, uh, uh. He said, the problem with that is, I gave him $500. But the problem was, the check we had written was for $1,500. <laughs> if he had not said what he wanted, he would have walked away three times more blessed than he did when he left. But he's still walking away with his $500. He, he's made a demand. And now that he's made a demand, he got what he asked for. Mm -hmm. yep. The gospel is not for sale. Mm -hmm. The gospel is to be taught and preached regardless. Mm -hmm. The gospel of Jesus Christ 
will make its own honorary. The gospel will. Because I told preachers, I said, now what you've given me, I can't give you that. You come and you get it. You still want to come? <laughs> and they still come. So we have to adjust our lives to what God is doing. God has perfect timing. When God speaks to you, you need to believe and obey God. Who's next? We have to believe and obey God. Uh, this is Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And now we're going to Genesis chapter 21, verses 5 through 7. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to, Abra to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Another paragraph. Do not assume, however, that the moment God calls you, you are prepared for the assignment. How long was it from the time God spoke to Abram until Isaac? The child of promise was born. 25 years. Why did God wait 25 years? Because it took God 25 years to make Abraham a father suitable for Isaac. God was concerned not, not so much about Abram, but about founding a nation. The quality of the father will affect the quality of following generations. As goes the father, so go the next several generations. God took time to build Abram into a man of character. Abram immediately began adjusting his life to God's ways. He could not wait until Isaac was born and then try to become the kind of father required to raise a patriarch of God's people. We cannot assume that we are tremendously ready and prepared the moment God calls us. And I'm not talking about being called to preach. I'm talking about being called to God's service. Don't take for granted that you're prepared just because God called you. God doesn't call us just to play games and he doesn't call us just to play the waiting game. God calls us because he's more concerned about his purpose and his ways than he is about us. Wow. That dropped on me like a sack of bricks. I said a sack of bricks. God has called us to do what we do not because he concerned, he's concerned about the way we feel. He's not even concerned about who we are or what position we hold. And here it teaches us he's not concerned about our age. God is more concerned about his purpose, his will, and his ways. Ooh, good God Almighty. Why would God take 25 years to give Abram what he promised him? And the clock never stopped ticking. I'm telling you, the clock's still going on. Years still passing. 25 years passed. When you look at Genesis chapter 12, the Bible says he was 75 years old. You look at Genesis chapter 21, and the Bible says he was 100 years old. Like I told Pastor Smith, I don't have 30 years. I just, I, I can't do it. I can't wait 30 years. God, have mercy now. 
And that's all our prayer. Everybody, if there's 55 folk in the room, if there's 250 people in the room, it's all of our prayer. Lord, deliver now, Lord, deliver now. Be the mailman now, Lord. Be the mailman now. Every time we hear the doorbell ring, oh, that's God out there. <laughs> and it's just Amazon taking a picture. <laughs> God, come on, God. But Abram trusted God. It took God 25 years to prepare Abram to be the father that was fit for action. Isn't that all amazing? It took God. Now, God can do anything. He can do it in an instance. And we like when he does it in an instant. It took God 25 years to get Abram right to be a father suitable for Isaac. 25 years. 25 years. Let me just put this in here. Um, it took God 37 years to prepare me for Sister Davis. <laughs> I figured I'd get an amen there, but let me see if I get one here. It took God 40 years to prepare Sister Davis for me. <laughs> Say amen right there. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Amen. It takes God, God's timing. So what's the better, Sister Davis Davis? What's the best? It took God 37 years, only 37 years, only 37 years to prepare me for Sister Davis. But it took God 40 years to get her heart right, get her mind right, get her attitude right. Boy, God was working overtime. Oh, Lord, here we go. <laughs> Brother, we're probably outnumbered tonight. Right? <laughs> Let me see what this book says. It says. <laughs> <laughs> it took God 25 years to prepare Abraham to be a fit, a suitable daddy for Isaac. <laughs> this is an important thing. The quality of the father will affect the quality of the following generations. The quality, regardless of who you are, regardless of who you are influences, influencing, you will make a difference for generations to come. America is writing history. And grandchildren and great-grandchildren that are not born are going to ask, Granddaddy, Papa, where were you and how did you take this when all this drama was going on in the 2000s? We are writing history. Where did you stand? What did you do? Did you just let it happen? It's a shame how some men could go home and look their children and their wives in the face. Being the cowards they are. Mm. We are writing history for generations to come. As goes the father, so goes the next several generations. That's why the Bible teaches that a good man saves an inheritance for his children's children. And it's not talking about stopping your grandchildren. You will save an inheritance for generations, several generations to come. And it's not just talking about money. Your attitude, your worship, your style of worship, whether you took your children to church or not, that set the pattern. Say again. We dropped the ball. The baby boomers, we passed it on. But what's the generation right under the baby boomer? That would say, I ain't going to do that for my child. I'm not going to make my child like my parents made me. I was in the church uh, all day Sunday and three, four times during the week. And I'm not going to make my child do that. And 
And now children don't know what churches are really all about. We drop the ball. And the, the tragedy is not that they don't go to church. The tr tragedy is that they have no consciousness of what church is about. Therefore, disrespect has taken over. Therefore, murder and shootings over and over again takes place. Therefore, people will shoot up a school and a church just as if they would be on the field fighting in the army. Because the ball was dropped, we didn't pass on that righteousness that God has shown us. But there's hope. We can still get it back together. We got to still stay focused. Got to still do it. The thing about this piece that says that Abraham had to be prepared for Isaac, our hearts have to be turned toward God in such a way that we stand up and speak out that if you're going to be in this household, Joshua says, as for me and my house, we going to serve the Lord. Oh, that's right. I used to say all the time, I'm going to do whatever I want to do when I leave mama's house. <laughs> I've been gone since I'm 16. I still can't do anything I want to do. Right. <clears throat> because it was passed from one generation to the other. You have a consciousness of God. You have a respect for senior citizens. You have a respect for your parents. And you understand that what they taught you then, that they thought you weren't listening to, you are living by those principles now. Amen. How many of you wash dishes with Purex or y'all call it Clorox? Anybody? Two, three people. I got to have at least a couple cap, cap, caps in there because I grew up putting caps. I mean, I thought all y'all did that. Y'all don't do that. We took our dish, well, I took our dishwasher out. Because it was too much trouble to keep clean. Why buy a machine that you got to wash the dishes before you put them in it and then you run the water and you're using water and electricity? Why buy a machine that's going to make money accumulate going out of the house? Right now we got shelves that we pull out and put stuff in and push it back in. Right where the dishwasher put. I ain't grow with no dishwasher. I did grow with dishwasher. Me, you. <laughs> These were my dishwasher. Dishwasher hands too. Where did we move? Where did we move from when children had to take? Daddy made a step for us to stand up to the to the sink. We weren't even tall enough, but we were washing dishes. Yeah. Men in my day used to give boys one bag of groceries to carry in. So when they get older, they wouldn't let their mama carry groceries in. When I was three, I was struggling with a bag of groceries. <laughs> when I got 15, mama, I got it. Mm -hmm. I'm on the whole car. Mm -hmm. Now, Sister Davis calls me from the outside and said, come get this stuff out of the car. I'm prepared. <laughs> Life has taught me. Yes. And guess what I do? Let me, let me put my shoes on. I'm on my way. It takes time for God to move in our lives, but when he does move, we have to adjust our lives to God's ways. Even though Abraham couldn't wait for a child, he had to wait on God. Who's next? How long was it after God, through Samuel, anointed David king before David mounted the throne? Maybe 10 or 12 years? What was God doing in the meantime? <laughs> he was building David's relationship with himself. As gold king, so goes the nation. You cannot bypass character. How long was it after the living God called the house of Paul until Paul went on his first missionary journey? 
maybe 10 or 11 years. The focus was not on Paul. The focus was on God. God wanted to redeem a lost world, and he wanted to redeem the Gentiles through Paul. God took time to prepare Paul for the assignment. So God takes time to prepare Paul. He takes time to prepare David. He takes time to prepare us. 40 years for Moses. God calls Moses. 40 years later, he's leaving. Then he gets to the Red Sea. An 80 year old man with a stick in his hand said, Go forward. <laughs> so let's look, let's, let's look at this. God took time to prepare Paul for the assignment. He took time to prepare Moses. He took time to prepare Daniel. He, put, he took time to prepare David. He took time to prepare us. We're talking about 12 years, 11 years, 10 years. Preachers today say that they are called to preach, but they don't want to go to school. They say that they are called to preach, and next Sunday they want to preach. Fact of the matter is, you don't know anything to preach. Talking about the Spirit of God will lead me. Sit down somewhere. It's ignorance. We have to get to a point where we realize that training and preparation ought to be 90% of our ministry. 90% of our ministry ought to be preparation. And it takes only 10% about the ministry to fulfill what God has called us to do. What's the greatest example? Jesus. Lived 33 years. 30 years without ministry. Three years doing ministry. That's 90%. So God prepares us 90% of the time to do 10% ministry. Isn't that awesome? God want to make sure that you can help. Let me kind of rush through this one. Questions. Look at D. This is the one that's true. When God speaks, I immediately adjust my schedule to respond to what he said. I have to adjust my schedule. The pastor says that it wasn't about us. It's not about us. It's about God and what God wants. It's about God and God's purpose. We have to adjust to God. And as we adjust to God, we immediately respond to what God is saying. Now, A and B, A, B, and C are, are good, but that's not the right answer. So let's look at A, B, and C. Yeah, D is the correct answer. That's what we're supposed to do. So are you suggesting? Okay. Tell me what you do, A, B, and C. Read that one for us, please. Who has the mic? Statement that applies to you. Read all four of those and then answer them and stop right where for your character matters. Okay. Uh, I read my Bible to be a good Christian. But I don't expect God to speak to me through the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Absolutely false. So I, I read my Bible, I, and I'm reading it because I'm a good Christian. I, I got to check that box, right? right? But I don't expect God to speak to me through the scriptures. We know that's not right. We ought to read it because we are a good Christian, but we do expect God to speak to us. B. B says, I seek a word from God so I can be encouraged to have a great day. We ought to get encouragement from the word of God. C. C, I seek a word from God so I am alert to what he wants to do in and through my life. We ought to be alerted through the word of God so we can see what God wants us to do. Read E first. E, when God speaks, I write down what he said, but do little about it. How true is that? We got, I see people with notebooks when I'm preaching. I said, Lord, thank you. But my question is, when do you sit down and look at those notes? How many of you all take notes in Bible study? Anybody? Yeah. 
Everybody? How many of y'all take notes on Sunday morning? How many of y'all go back and look at those notes? How many of you don't say it? How many of you don't do it and don't want to say you don't do it? So David's David's like, Tom got me in a corner now. Like, <laughs> two, he's trying to make me mad. <laughs> okay, Sister Davis, Davis, can you read that, that final paragraph there right after those questions? You want me to read D? Sister Davis, Davis. With the mic, please. After the question. We are so oriented. We are so oriented to quick response that we abandon the word from God long before he has developed our character. When God speaks, he has a purpose in mind for our lives. The moment he speaks is the time we need to begin responding to him. Thank you. So when we look at this, we are so oriented that we want quick fix. We want it fixed right now. We are so oriented to a quick response. We want God to respond, but we don't want to respond. So we abandon the word of God long before God develops our character. My subject tonight is character matters. And character is developed. Character is something you have to be worked with. Character must be worked on. Character is what you carry with you. Character is who you are. Now, I may have a bad reputation, but it ought not be my character. There are some things that you can hear about me, and I believe that every person online and every person in this room will say, no, he wouldn't do that now. I, I, I asked that dumb question in prison one day. I had been teaching these guys in prison for seven years. They knew my character. I thought they did. We were looking at TV as I was walking out. They were looking at the news, and, and I just stopped, and I said, look at this guy. They were saying, this preacher is in handcuffs. Rev, did you see that? I said, yeah, but what would you think if you saw me in handcuffs? Some of them said, well, we would say they got it wrong. Some of us say, well, I wonder what happened. But some of them say, I would say, I knew that joke when all he cracked up. <laughs> <laughs> I know he coming out here faking on us. <laughs> now he's locked up just like we are. My I should have taken a poll and see if one of the deacons at the New Beginning Church was one of them. <laughs> just to say, he said, I knew he wasn't all he was cracked up to be. I said, well, I expected that from you all, but that's, that's all right. So when God speaks, he has a purpose in mind, and we have to live out that purpose. When God speaks, God wants us to have character enough to immediately respond to him. When God speaks, it's not about us. It's about God. God has the nerve, the audacity, the galls to make it about God. It's not about us. I'm so glad they didn't see me with handcuffs on because they had already come to the conclusion. My reputation out, 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 proceeded my character. I have spent seven years with them laboring every Friday for seven years and they said they didn't know my character. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> but you know, some people are always looking for something to get, get you on anyway. Mm -hmm. Character matters. Mm -hmm. Next week we're going to talk about character matches your assignment. So go ahead and read to the end of this, this chapter. Um, character ought to match your assignment. God has called you. He is using your character to match your assignment. God wants you to be there. God wants you to handle his business. If you handle God's business, God knows how to handle your business. 
If you handle God's business, God will handle your business. Amen. Matthew 6, 33 says it like this. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. Seek him because it's not about you. Amen. Jesus knew his assignment. Mm -hmm. Peter tried to get Jesus killed in a midnight brawl. But Jesus took Malchus' ear off the ground, planted it back on his head. Peter wanted a gangster, be a gangster out there in the wilderness. Jesus says to Peter, put up your knife, put up your sword, put up your dagger. We ain't going to live like that. Jesus already knew he was on his way to Calvary. And he died for you and me on Calvary. He was buried after he died. And he rose from the dead. The door of the church is open. Amen. The invitation is extended. We must know our assignment. The assignment for somebody tonight is to, to get to know Jesus. Receive Jesus as your personal Savior. This is your moment to get to know him. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite him into your life, believing that he's the son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he died, gave his life. But early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. If you can trust this story, just bow your head with me right now and invite him into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God. We believe that if you honestly pray this prayer, you are now born again. We believe that you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We believe that you're on your way to heaven when you leave planet Earth. Thank you for joining us tonight in Bible study. Please join us every Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. Join us for Bible study. Join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. 9 a.m. for Sunday school. And... Hang out with us at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning for our morning worship service. Again, thank you for joining us. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord. It is offering and sacrificial gift. It's an opportunity to give to the Lord. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by zailing to lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zell account is lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it to P.O. Box 7, P.O. Box 503. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Please remember uh, this Sunday, second Sunday in September 2024, that's September the 8th, 2024, we'll be celebrating 20 years as the pastor of the New Beginning Church, and I am glad about it. God has kept us together for 20 years, and we praise God for it, 20 years. We will be celebrating at 10.30 a.m. Come on by and be a part of our worship service as we celebrate what God has already done. Also, on September the 29th, September 29th, 5th Sunday, September the 29th, we will be welcoming Pastor Earl Reed, William Earl Reed, from uh, Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta, and the churches in the Mississippi Delta will be here to celebrate our family and friends day. We're looking forward to a busload of people along with their, their visitors and also their family members who live here in the state of Texas. We are welcoming them, so please be a part of our family and friends day fifth sunday in september are there any praise reports or prayer requests praise reports or prayer requests okay let us stand to be dismissed we're praying for those on our prayer list we're praying for the miles family we're praying for 
brother Miles, we pray for his sisters, that God will continue to bless and keep them at this junction in their lives. Father God, we thank you now. We honor you. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you will do. We ask you to bless us as we go down from this place. Bless us, Father God, that we will always lift up the name of Jesus. Bless us that we will walk with you. And bless us, Lord, that we will always obey your voice. Lord, we ask you to speak to us now. Remind us of our assignment. Bless us to be developing our character through you. Bless us as your word come to us, Father God that we will abandon our schedules and obey you. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for the privilege of singing songs unto you tonight. We pray that you bless our choir as they come forth in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you now. We ask you to give us safe passage home. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. God bless you. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, we'll draw all men unto me. God, unto him. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Bless the name of, of Jesus. God has blessed us one more time. We praise him forever.